I think we will get started. So I just informed today is September 4th, <laughs> and this is the fifth uh, installment of the 12 game series. And it's my pleasure to introduce Kim Dohui today. Um, as with the other speakers, since they're going to talk to you about their journey, we won't spend a lot of time on their biography, but we'll hear some of that. Uh, I will just give a personal note. I've known Kim since she arrived in Baltimore for graduate school when I was still in graduate school, but she's much younger than I am. She started later. Uh, so that's um, now 30 plus years. Um, 88. So long, 1988. <laughs> 38 years. Do the math, it's not my start. Too. So Kim is uh, a full professor in. Uh, at Johns Hopkins in genetic medicine and pathology, so two appointments, and try to get through how many appointments she has. <laughs> She's the director of the Center for Inherited Disease Research. She's the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Genomics of Johns Hopkins Genomics. She's the co-director of the Kennedy Krieger Institute of Intellectual Development and Disabilities Research Center Genomics Board. Um, and she's the co-director of the Johns Hopkins um, graduate program in living genetics, which I don't even think we listed here. Yeah. Um, and so as you can see, we have someone who's got um, several decades of experience in living genetics, and today she's going to cover a little bit more of the technology and how we generate genetics data, where she's going to start with her journey. So we'll turn it over to Kim. Great. Well, thank, thanks for the invite. This is really exciting. And, um, I have to admit, I haven't ever spoken to kind of this type of audience before, so bear with me. But um, I'm ex really excited, and I'm very glad I made the drive in person. It's so much easier to talk to <laughs> people instead of just a camera. And um, I have not met speaking through just a camera yet. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to stay out there and talk to all of you, however long you would like. Okay, so me, a little bit about me. Um, I am from the Midwest. My family, my both my mother's and father's side of the families were farmers. So they grew up on farms in Iowa. And um, I did not grow up on a farm, but um, I uh, started my, uh, I was born in Indiana. My uh, father ended up going to college. He was the first person um, in, in his family to get a bachelor's degree. And he um, started out in real estate and then moved to insurance, um, traveled around a lot, as a lot of insurance people do, at least back in those days. Um, so I was born in Indianapolis. We moved several times until I was four. And when we settled back in Iowa, in Des Moines. So my early years were um, in Iowa until I was 10. And then we moved to Madison, Wisconsin, which is um, really a much more cosmopolitan and um, academic uh, uh, oasis <laughs> in the Midwest. So um, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, it really is a college town, the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, it's a beautiful place with many lakes. And um, I was really uh, blessed to live there from the time I was 10 until after I graduated um, from college. Um, I was asked to talk about the moment when I thought I would want to pursue science. And on reflection, um, that really was in high school. Um, and I had a wonderful physics teacher who just really made physics. I had always liked math and, and liked kind of the bio, biological sciences, but um, uh, he really made, he made science fun. And I then, of course, I, so I thought, oh, well, I love physics. Um, so I thought oh, I will be an engineer. And um, I went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, stayed close to home, you know, for personal reasons. <laughs> All my friends were there. My parents actually moved away, so I didn't have the close to home <laughs> issue. And um, and it was a great school. So anyway, it was a wonderful experience, about 40,000, I think it's still about that size, about 40,000 students, very large uh, university. And I started out um, as a freshman with my, um, uh, major in engineering. Um, I took engineering graphics as a required course my first um, semester and got an F. So on my first exam, I didn't end up with an F in the class, <laughs> but discovered that I really cannot visualize things in three dimensions. Um, so that really was like, okay, well, engineering is not going to work for me. So 
I started on to a little journey of um, exploration into different um, classes and um, took a few business classes, some economics classes, um, some more um, bio, you know, intro biology, microbiology type courses, and just happened to kind of pick an introductory to medical genetics course. And I absolutely fell in love with that introductory to medical genetics course, which was taught by uh, a woman who became my mentor for my undergraduate honors thesis, Dr. Lorraine Meisner. Um, she uh, was one of the early women pioneers in science, um, and um, she worked for the um, for the university, but also for the um, the health health and hygiene kind of group, the state uh, clinical lab group, um, doing clinical side genetics. Um, and so um, I uh, sat in a room with a bunch of old ladies and learned how to do a karyotype, and um, I loved, I just loved it. And fell in love with chromosomes and chromosome biology. And um, she was very interested in cancer genetics and the effect of um, toxins and um, looking at uh, experiments to look at chromosome breakage related to toxins in, in the environment at the time. So that's how I got to be kind of a geneticist. A little kind of side funny story is um, I was inducted into Phi Beta Kappa and um, I went to the ceremony and I didn't even think I had my parents come because I don't think I what it was at the time, but went to the ceremony and I got called up to the stage. I was kind of a surprise award. And they gave me an award for being a well-rounded student. Well, I was a well-rounded student, so I didn't, didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. <laughs> I always thought that was kind of funny, but um, I'm like, you have such a broad diversity of medicine. <laughs> but anyway, so I graduated in 1988. I thought I pulled these pictures because it, they really show that at, by the time I graduated in 1988, I was a true genetics geek. So this is what we did <laughs> with our um, our graduation uh, hats. Um, we, 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 my myself and my friends, this is me here, um, put the uh, bases on our hats, and um, we even put the as you can see. The hydrogen bonds in between. We had three between <laughs> two and A and T. And our friend, who you can see has the beer here, was a little bit of a <laughs> not quite as scholarly as the rest of us, was our friendly URSL at the top there. <laughs> anyway, so I love genetics. I knew I loved genetics. I um as I told you, I did not come from an academic family, but um I loved school. I'd always loved school. And um I was like, what the heck? Why don't I try to and um, applied to the very small number of human genetic programs that are around at the time, it's pretty much Michigan, Hopkins, Yale, and I threw in San Diego for fun because I thought San Diego would be a fun place to live. They did not have a human genetics program. I did get accepted there. My dad was always very, very angry with me because he's a golfer and he would have loved to move <laughs> to San Diego and play golf for the rest of his life. But I ended up coming out to Hopkins um, and came to the human genetics training program that happened, as Larry mentioned. Larry was there uh, five or six years before me, but um, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful environment. And when I interviewed, I just, even though Johns Hopkins and Baltimore and the big East Coast terrified me, I had to take, take this opportunity because the investigators were just so enthusiastic about genetics and, and their careers and what they were researching. Um, so I had the distinct, um, pleasure and honor to be to be trained by a number of the really um, huge figures in human genetics, including Dr. Marvin Jean, uh, Dr. David Valley, Dr. Kate Zazian, and especially Dr. McCusick and Burton Childs, who are really the fathers of the medical genetics. Um, it was a wonderful experience. The, the training program has always been very kind of open-minded about um, teaching, um, focusing on teaching how uh, the variation from the human genome is tied to both health and disease phenotypes, but also making sure that we're just teaching good science. Um, so I came in, I was very enthusiastic about human genetics, clinical genetics, because I came from that thesis in a, in a clinical lab. Um, but um, I really wanted to look at, um, to study chromosomes and how chromosomes segregated, and that wasn't that easy to do at the time in humans. Um, there was some cell genetics going on, and, and Barbara it was very, very good in that area. But um, I ended up joining a Saccharomyces cerevisiae lab that did study chromosome uh, segregation. But um, I joined a lab with Dr. Phil Peter. This is a little bit 
the lab at the time for my uh, PhD thesis. Um, and basically, we studied chromosome and saccharomyces segregation in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and I ended up cloning the first eukaryotic kinetic protein. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. Um, as I then started to think about what I wanted to do after my PhD, I really missed, in the end, the clinical, the human, and kind of that experience. So I ended up going on to a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, kind of back in the fields of human and medical genetics. Um, I did a postdoctoral fellowship in um, clinical cytogenetics and clinical molecular genetics. Ended up staying at Hopkins, um, both because they were wonderful programs, but because of family reasons. Um, and um, was trained by two wonderful mentors, Dr. George Thomas and Dr. Gary Cuttings. Um, George Thomas was the director of the clinical cytogenetics lab at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which I'm still affiliated with as Larry said. And um, he was very, um, also a, an extremely good mentor and um, good about keeping up with the field. And at the time, that was 1993-ish. Um, and molecular genetics was really um, kind of taking off. And um, so he really pushed me to push Gary to um, take me on as a molecular genetics fellow as well as a cytogenetics fellow at the time. And that certainly um, um, was a wonderful um, he, he offering me that basically to pay for my <laughs> molecular genetics fellowship. Um, uh, in retrospect, it was, it was very um, influential to my future career. So I became a board certified um, geneticist um, through the ABM G. It, it didn't used to be two Gs. Um, born in medical genetics, really thought I would go out and be what my first mentor was, Dr. Lynn Meister. I would run a clinical laboratory. Um, I, too long of a story to tell you why that didn't happen, but um, it didn't happen. And I ended up um, coming, going away briefly to work in industry, coming back. Um, I'm actually going to skip this slide, but um, just a brief shout out to my female mentors um, who really over the years um, pushed me along and um, showed me the joy of doing research and um, have been wonderful along, along the way. Um, I ended up back at Hopkins at the Center for Inherited Disease Research, um, which is um, was originally founded as a contract um, to Johns Hopkins from NIH. Um, it's um, been around now um, for 1997. Um, I was the first hire, along with an administrator, um, have been there ever since and have grown the center. And basically, in really simple terms, what we do is gene hunting, um, using many different technologies along the way, but that's that's the core of what we do. We are searching for the genetic underpinnings of, um, we actually started out in the, in the late 90s trying to get at complex traits. Um, and then along the way, as um, next generation sequencing came out, we kind of backtracked around and did a full circle to Mendelian traits. And, um, and we continue on really with the complex trait hunt now with sequencing as well. So, I'm already behind, so I'll go back. Mm. Um, I'm going to focus on technology. This is a slide and a reference I would um, recommend. It's a short little review of human disease genetics. Um, this is a very busy slide, which of course you can't see, but I just wanted to highlight that I'm really going to focus, as Larry said, on the technologies that we use to um, to look at uh, the genetics of, um, of ourselves and how to use those genetics to um, figure out why why we have different diseases and why we, why we all look different, all those things. So gene hunting. Um, when we start thinking about how do we figure out how our variation in our genome actually um, correlates or is associated with our disease um, phenotypes that we see, the traits that we see, the first thing we have to do is figure out um, well what is within that, that genome. And so what we started to do way back when um, was what we call genotyping is basically in really broad terms, you want to somehow determine what an individual's genetic makeup is and how it differs from the person sitting next to you. And the first way that we started to do, to do that was through mapping. Um, uh, this is just a kind of an overview figure. So um, there's kind of two different kinds of maps. We started out by only being able to do genetic maps, which basically um, <clears throat> using a polymorphism, which um, is defined as 
uh, was defined at one time as a mutation with an allele frequency of greater than 1%. We don't really use that word mutation as much anymore, but at the time it really meant a difference in someone's genome that was present in the population at a frequency of more than 1%. And we could use these polymorphisms, these markers, DNA within the genome. And if that region happened to include the disease gene, you might imagine that you could actually follow that as, a, as it is transmitted from person to person in the family. <clears throat> and that's what we call linkage analysis. Um, just briefly, the different types of genetic variants that are present in our genome. Um, this top line here is really just a schematic of, uh, if you can imagine, a really small piece of a reference genome here, um, basically a gene um, with the um, 5 prime UTR, 3 prime um, UTR, and the exons, the little black lines. Well, actually, well, this is kind of an odd diagram, but um, just think of this as the reference genome. And then a single nucleotide polymorphism is one base change in that reference genome. And as I said, that polymorphism, which is present at a frequency of over 1%, um, it can be a, a rare variant or what we now kind of refer to as a mutation, which would be an extremely rare difference or one that's definitely less than a low frequency of 1%. Um, and the more common term that people use now to kind of avoid the whole complication of whether the low frequency is less than 1% or more than 1% is people now refer to these single base changes as single nucleotide variants or SNVs. Uh, another type of polymorphism is what is termed both a microsatellite or a short tandem repeat. These are regions of the genome um, which have um, the same three, four, five, actually two, three, four, five base pair um, sequences in tandem. So just sequence after sequence after sequence after sequence. And um, they can get quite large. And uh, so these are another type of variation that's quite common in the genome. You can have an insertion. So you can have basically a piece of genome inserted into the gen genome, which is so my genome would have a piece of DNA, which is not present in the reference. We would call that an insertion. Deletion would be if my genome is missing a piece of what we see in the reference. We'd call that a deletion variant within myself. And then copy number variation is really, <clears throat> we have a piece of the genome that is then replicated, um, um, usually um, in tandem um, in the genome. And then, so it's very simplified, but just to give you the ideas. So the first type of markers that we um, used to be able to start to look at how do we correlate or identify regions of the genome which might contain disease genes were called restriction fragment length polymorphism. In 1978, Dan Nathans got the Nobel Prize for the discovery and the use of restriction enzymes. Um, that was with Werner Abel and Hamilton Smith. Um, and we then used these restriction enzymes. So the enzymes um, were cut particular sequence, um, small sequence um, motifs within the genome, for instance, <coughs> um, shown here, uh, that cut site was GTATCC. And if there was a single base change in an individual, that enzyme would then not cut. Um, so um, uh, let's see here. So here you have a change in that cut site. And so you do not get, the enzyme will not cut so uh, back in the day, before we even had fluorescent or any of those types of technologies, we would then um, basically cut up the genome with one of these restriction enzymes, and we would see differences from person to person in the size of the fragments that we would be able to see by electrophoresing the DNA through a gel and then <clears throat> hybridizing to um, a piece of DNA, which was radio labeled, to basically show us the particular part of the genome, and we would do something called a southern blot. And this is one way, the very first way, that people were able to mark pieces of the genome and track those pieces as, um, as through a family. Um, so the, uh, the first gene, the Huntington's disease gene, was the first gene mapped, um, and that was in 1983. It was mapped to the short arm of chromosome 4, and it used only 12 of these markers, which is pretty amazing. So 12 RFP, RFLP markers were used. Um, there was uh, two large pedigrees from a very isolated island um, that had a founder effect and many, many um, people with Huntington's disease. 
So very powerful genetics to be able to follow and try to find <clears throat> the, the area of the genome. Um, but with only 12 RF peace markers and these two very large pedigrees, they were able to map the Huntington's disease gene uh, to the short armor Huntington 4 back in 1983. Um, RFLPs were used clinically as well. So um, some of the first clinical genetics tests were um, to look for sickle cell disease, which is one of the first well-studied uh, human genes. Um, don't need to go into the details, but basically um, the causal variant for sickle cell actually um, coincidentally did um, result in a change in a restriction fragment um, enzyme cutting site. So we were able to develop very early on clinical tests to be able to um, identify whether a person was a carrier or had, you know, confirmed that someone had sickle cell disease through all these RFLP markers. Um, the next type of marker that was used is uh, short tandem repeat markers. These, again, I, I talked to you about um, um, microsatellites or short tandem repeat polymorphisms, the same thing, basically repetitive units of one to six base pairs. Um, they have a very high mutation rate. So there's a lot of variation from person to person in the number of um, uh, repeat units you have for each of these um, loci across your genome. Um, this actually results in a really high information content. If you can think about, if you're looking at a mother and a father and kids, and you have a marker which you're following, which has very frequently, maybe like 12 different alleles. So it's very, very likely that your mother and father are going to have different alleles. So you can easily trace the segregation of those markers through the family. That's why they're very powerful, high information content. <clears throat> they have high mutation rates because of, um, as the DNA polymerase is copying the DNA and these triple repeats, they're slippage. And that's what's shown here. <clears throat> the short tandem repeat markers are assayed fairly simply. So we're moving on past the time when we um, uh, PCR was developed. Um, but basically, you can piece, put PCR primers down that flank these repeat regions. And um, Basically, in a single PCR reaction, you can um, <clears throat> uh, amplify that particular region of the genome and then electrophoresis them again through a gel and then identify the size of those fragments. And so um, this was a technology that was um, developed fairly rap rapidly and used quite successfully for um, um, identifying a number of uh, Mendelian disease genes in the um, 80s and 90s. And um, another common use um, currently for, still currently, for these tandem repeat polymorphisms is forensics. So when you when you when you talk about um, the FBI being involved in identifying remains or identifying criminals, um, I believe they even still now are still using the short tandem repeat polymorphism panels for that because of the really high information content you get from each of those markers. So the short tandem repeat polymorphisms, as, as I said, were basically um, developed and um, uh, kind of optimized for Mendelian disease recovery uh, discovery using linkage mapping. And once a region of the genome, usually about at the smallest we could get was about a 10 megabase region, was identified as being top, maybe the region where a disease gene was, then you would go on and do positional cloning, which I don't have time to get into that technology right now. Um, but in the end, we had about 400 individual PCR reactions that we would um, um, process on each person um, to do a linkage scan. Um, <clears throat> um, the first position of clone gene uh, was um, to ask gene. Anybody, um, am I allowed to ask a question in the middle? Sure. <laughs> Anybody have a thought about why um, some of the first Positional clones genes would actually be on us. Yeah. So maybe because it's like from the fetus or the mom? Kind of. So that's the idea. So um, because of the segregation pattern in the families, we kind of a priori knew but it was an excellent gene because we saw no male to male transmission. You never saw the disease going from a man to a man. It was always. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, there was um, a lot of information, and we were pretty darn sure that it was on the X, um, could do some link mapping and really focus on the X chromosome. And so it was just kind of an easy, as they say, low-hanging fruit 
um, for for the different uh, investigators to start with to, to look at African diseases. Um, and then the Huntington disease that I talked about before, I told you it was mapped in 1983. It wasn't cloned until 10 years later in 1993. And um, that was because it happened to be located at the very end, um, near the telomere of chromosome 4, in a very repetitive region of the genome. And the telomeres also have a lot of uh, recombination. So it was really, really difficult to really narrow it and, and find the gene using our technology at the time. Um, OK, so after a lot of success, cloning and identifying um, and dealing with disease genes, um, we all wanted to go further and start looking at the more complex traits. And complex traits really are trait or diseases or phenotypes or we say traits, um, things like heart disease, cancer, things you think about that are kind of common, they sometimes run in families, sometimes don't. Um, but really, from twin studies, we could tell that twins were more likely to have the, the same of these diseases slash traits. So we knew there was some genetic components, some heritability going on. Um, but um, the, the complex traits, basically, the phenotype results from an interaction between genes and your environmental exposures, your environmental, environmental experiences. <laughs> and um, but we of course, wanted to tackle them and um, figure out um, what some of the susceptibility, low size susceptibility alleles might be for these complex traits. Um, and kind of the promise is that, that we would be able to start looking at prevention of some of these very common um, diseases that were really impacting um, the population in a much wider um, and a much wider way than the, the rare Mendelian disorders. Um, and so the promise really was that we'd be able to get to pre-symptomatic diagnosis. We could get to treatment. We could get to prevention of these very common diseases. Um, so in order to do that, we really needed to be able to move from these family-based linkage studies to population-based association studies. And the population-based association studies would be testing for differences in allele frequencies between the case and control. That's the key point. The difference between a linkage study where you're following the segregation of a piece of the genome markers through a family to an association study where you're looking at a population, you're looking at people that have a disease and don't have a disease, and you're really looking at for every locus slash variant in the genome, is there a difference in the little frequency in, in the cases in the controls? So you really require very dense variation to do association studies. <laughs> and um, most of the time, we're still using markers, though. So we're looking at um, variants, so mostly kind of single nucleotide variants in the genome, which are not causal, they're not causing the disease, or they're not even causing the susceptibility to the disease, but they are marking, again, a piece of the genome, which is very close um, in proximity to the causal variants, So, but there's an indirect association. So we call this um, kind of the phenomenon where um, pieces travel together through um, many thousands of years, um, it's uh, linkage to equilibrium. So uh, I think you all know about meiosis, the combination. So um, <clears throat> as um, if you think about the population scale, um, even though there's lots of recombination going through every generation, um, you do still end up with small pieces of the genome, which really do travel together. And we call that linkage to equilibrium. Um, so uh, genome-wide associations, really, association studies are what we, the tool we um, use to then, in a hypothesis-free manner, start to investigate these complex traits. And we needed a big catalog of these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there's a lot of nation, national projects um, led by NHGRI in many cases um, to develop these catalogs, uh, the International Hep Map Project and the Thousand Genome Projects, uh, to name a, a couple of them. And we also needed a really efficient, accurate way to genotype many hundreds of thousands to millions of stems, which we didn't have at the time. We were doing single PCR reactions, running these short can repeat polymorphisms. So we needed a technology breakthrough as well. And that really was uh, genotyping microarrays. Um, the microarrays I'm going to talk about are I'm mainly just going to focus on Illumina because that's really the player that's still out there and used today. Um, so the Illumina technology is. Um, that starts with the silicon wafer, which looks a lot like a microscope slide, because it pretty much is. And um, the kind of the magic to it is they have these silica beads, which are um, 
uh, uh, micron, my, um, well, single micron pipe, um, which are randomly assorted into my, into um, uh, micro wells on the bead. These beads then are coated with oligos, which allows them to identify, the company does identify the beads. So they randomly um, put these beads across the array. And then because there's oligos attached to those, they can then kind of decode which bead is at which position on every array. So it's a more efficient way to do this instead of having to on a position on an array. So um, they can kind of put it on there and then figure out where they all are afterwards. So that's called the decoding process. And then each of these beads also contains, um, well, I'll get back to that. But um, so the, um, the chemistry is really quite simple. So you start out with human genomic DNA and you un uniformly amplify the whole genome um, using doing what we call a whole genome amplification reaction. It's basically the 529 enzyme in the um, isothermal reaction performs a circular amplification of the genome. And you get a big pot of human DNA. Um, and um, you then cut that into small pieces and you hybridize the whole thing to this array, this array that has these beads arranged on it. Um, this particular array that I'm showing here is the global diversity array, which has eight samples. And um, each sample then would be placed on the array across this um, stripe position here. So you can um, basically reload a sample here, we load one here, 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 with some fancy robotics. <clears throat> and then if we go back to those beads, so those beads, we know the positions of them um, within each of, of these um, uh, sample uh, slots on the array. And each of these beads then has oligos on them, which are specific for a region of the genome, which, and the oligo ends right before that single nucleotide position that we talked about. So we have these maps of hundreds of thousands of single, single nucleotide variants. And we put an oligo that sits down right next to that base, which is different. And so our first step in the um, selectivity in, in, this, in this chemistry, um, it's very um, accurate because it has kind of two steps to the ability for it to distinguish <clears throat> these variants. First is this hybridization reaction, which allows us to have some selectivity. We basically hybridize at particular temperatures and then we wash the arrays at particular conditions. So that's has this one level of accuracy. And then the second level of accuracy is then we do a single base extension reaction um, with labeled uh, uh, nucleotides, fluorescent nucleotides. And this, so this, this single base extension reaction is a second level of specificity for um, the detection of the genotypes. And this is, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, basically the genotypes that are called using automated software and um, each dot in this uh, diagram here is a sample, and you're looking at data for probably a couple of thousand samples here for one variant position, for one single nucleotide polymorphism or single nucleotide variant. And I talked to you about the colored fluorescent nucleotides. So if basically you, if you look at the raw data here, what you're detecting is color in both of those channels. And if you have a homozygote, you only see the one color. If you can't for the homozygote reference, you see the other color. And heterozygote, you have a combination of those two colors. So the software does fancy normalization, and, um, and you can adjust kind of these cluster positions. But basically, in the end, you can say, for this sample, at this position, this person is a homozygote at that position. So that's what genotyping is. And that's how GWAS arrays work. I think I might see. Yeah, but basically, GWAS arrays, you can also use the data from these GWAS arrays to um, look at this copy number variance that I was telling you about. So that intensity data can be, be able to tell whether there's a deletion in that region of the genome. You can simply line up all the data, take all those variants, map them along the chromosome, line all the data up, and you can see differences in the intensity in a person. So you can see, you can identify deletions and duplications as well. Um, the genome association studies, uh, the arrays that you, that you choose to use are really driven by the population of the population that you have. So it's driven by the ethnicity, the genetic ancestry of those people. Um, those linkage disequilibrium blocks I talked about are smaller in an African population than in a European population. 
So um, the array choice is very important. Um, the accuracy, the data completeness, and of course the cost really drive your choice of an array for a GWAS study. And that's right out there. Question? I have a question. Uh -huh. So earlier you were talking about um, genetics, or sorry, changing your genetics you know, at time, and part of that is at genetics. And where exactly within the do, do, do you see genetic, or sorry, epigenetic changes within the GWAS studies, or where are you guys trying to account for that at all? Not with the original GWAS studies. We really looked at mainly single nucleotide variation. Mm -hmm. So the epigenetics really is. Um, the main marker for that is methylation um, tags, so five methyl cytosine. Yeah. Um, there are now arrays which are designed to detect the five methyl cytosine sites across the genome. They're called methylation arrays. Mm -hmm. So we do specifically run um, studies now using um, methylation arrays. Um, they use a similar technology. So basically, those methylated sites are converted to um, through a, a process called bisulfate conversion. Yeah. To um, to a different base. So basically you can still genotype, but mm -hmm. what you're detecting is methylated cytosines. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But um, the, the studies I was talking about were not looking at methylation. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to get out of the presentation then. Okay, so this is just a reminder. We're talking about technologies. We're going to kind of move from um, kind of the top part of this um, diagram here. Where we're talking about genotyping technologies and markers. And um, I mentioned the HapMet resource. We talked about GWAS studies. And we're going to kind of move down into the bottom part of this um, uh, era of genomics and talk more about sequencing technologies. This is a very busy slide, really here just for a reference for you guys. Um, but there, um, Sequencing technologies really started in the late 70s, and we kind of divide them into three generations. The first generation we call second generation, and third generation sequencing. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, but again, this is really reference for you at the timeline, which is nice um, to look back on, um, which really takes you through the beginning with Sanger sequencing out to today, where I've added on some of the um, most um, current sequencing technologies. <clears throat> So what distinguishes these sequencing technologies generations that people talk about all the time? First generation sequencing, which we'll dive into a little bit um, deeper is really Sanger sequencing. So it's the, um, and it basically enabled sequencing of clonal DNA populations. Um, and I'll get into that more in a second, but it's a concept is you had genomic DNA and you had to clone it that particular piece that you wanted to sequence somehow. And this was before um, the days of PCR when Sanger sequencing started. And um, you could then sequence that piece of DNA, that but that one piece of DNA, not a single DNA molecule, but an amplified clone piece of DNA. Second generation sequencing took, went kind of went from one reaction at a time to many, many thousands to millions of reactions at a time. So we went, we basically exploded our capacity. And um, so, and that was by paralyzing these sequencing reactions um, on a surface. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But when you think about, think about going from one to many, 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 massively parallel at the same time. And then third generation methods, um, allow, instead of looking at an amplified region of the genome, we actually can take a, a native piece of DNA, a single strand of DNA, and sequence it. It's super cool. So, so third generation is really direct sequencing of single molecules of DNA, and that's what distinguishes it from the others. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen this slide a million times, but the um, Human Genome Project cost about $3 billion for us to generate a single human genome, and that um, ended in 2001. Um, and this was using first generation technologies. What started to drive the price down of sequencing was second generation 
technologies, which we'll talk about the details of. And then um, second generation sequencing technologies for a whole genome sequence right now, um, the cost can range depending on all the bells and whistles with it from about $300 to $600 a person. It has gone way, 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 way down. Third generation technologies are actually more expensive than second generation technologies. Um, third generation technologies are costing on the order of a couple of thousand dollars ish um, for a single human whole genome sequence right now. But you get both your epigenetics and your variation at the same time. So, first generation sequencing, as I said, um, started out with um, kind of a competition a little bit between um, Sanger and Maximum Gilbert. Um, the, 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 the technology was really um, developed almost sim simultaneously between um, these uh, two scientists, the two groups, um, one at Cambridge, one at Harvard, um, and they shared the Nobel Prize in 1980 for Sanger sequencing. Um, for any of you who actually do any sequencing or have done any sequencing, um, I, when I was putting the slides together for a course in Bar Harbor, I thought it was really cool because um, the, what was sequenced um, by Sanger um, was by X, which is something that we use routinely now as a, a control spike in every next generation sequencing reaction um, on the other platform. Um, so first generation sequencing, um, basically Sanger versus Maximum Gilbert, um, the Sanger sequencing uh, labels the primer or the di 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 dioxynucleotides. Maximum Gilbert labeled the whole double stranded template. Sanger used a single stranded, and Maximum Gilbert was double stranded. Maximum Gilbert used a lot of reagents which um, um, were very toxic, and um, it required a large quantity of radioactivity. And uh, Sanger did not. So, um, really, Sanger sequencing ended up dominating because it was less complex, there were less toxic. So you often hear people kind of talk about um, um, talk about Sangam and Max and Gilbert a little bit uh, interchangeably. They are different chemistries, um, and now you know Sangam sequencing one else and took over. Um, but basically, with Sangam sequencing, um, <clears throat> you have your um, uh, either the as I said, your primer that you're um, starting your sequencing. Um, Extension reaction with, or you can link that the actual nucleotides. And um, basically, you are doing a, a different reaction for every base. So you have four separate reactions, and you have uh, one of the uh, um, CNTPs is a dideoxy CNTP in each one of those reactions. So the dideoxy CNTP stops the reaction. And um, so you end up with, um, uh, like, if you add a dideoxy G into this reaction, the extension will stop at that dideoxy, so you will stop at the G position. So you can basically do these four reactions and then run the products out again on a gel and read the base by where, what size these fragments were. So in the A reaction, you have your smallest fragment, so you know the first base in the sequence was an A. The second biggest fragment that you got was a T, so you know the second base was a T. The third base was a G. So that is how we sequenced. We ran four separate reactions, we ran them out on a gel and literally read the sequence by looking up usually a radiograph. When I did it, I used F45, but um, this was a lot of my PhD thesis. <laughs> um, moving on, um, this technique was automated by Leroy Hood and um, Hunga Pillar, um, who were at uh, Caltech and a company called ABI in the late 1980s, and they basically developed a commercial platform which was able to automate this Sanger sequencing process by instead of uh, P32 or S35 labeling these dideoxys, they labeled them with a fluorescent um, tag. And um, so basically, uh, and then uh, the instruments were either large slap gels, very, very thin gels, um, and we ran the reactions out on these really, really long, large, very thin gels, or um, eventually what really helped the Human Genome Project along is when the technology advanced from these large lab gels to capillaries, and you could have automated loading and really start cranking out more like a factory the sequencing process. Um, Sanger sequencing today is really still the gold standard. It's what we kind of um, 
put everything up against. Um, it has about 99.99% accuracy or what we like to call T40. Um, we use it a lot for in clinical work for about validating a variant in family, um, for single gene testing, uh, filling in gaps when you're doing next generation sequencing, um, and um, various other things. Um, and then um, on the research side, um, we still use it for microbial work for um, when people are doing CRISPR task editing, they will confirm their edits using Sanger sequencing. So really Sanger sequencing is still a very active technology that's used in lots of labs every, every day. <clears throat> Just a really brief foray into my world. So I was at the Center for Inherited Disease Research, as I said, gene hunting. Um, we started out using doing those linkage studies I talked about. We were doing linkage studies, we were not doing sequencing, but we were using this technology that I talked about, the ABI sequencers. Um, and um, what we did was we genotyped about 550 reactions um, for samples for the linkage studies. Um, we really focused on automation, laboratory information management systems. We wanted to reduce the error rate in these studies as much as possible. And um, it was slow going. Um, our first project of 500 samples took over a year. And I just want some pictures are always fun. So just to show you what these instruments look like, this is an ABI uh, instrument. These are the large lab gels that I talked about. Very thin polyacrylamide gels, which were a pain in the butt to pour and not to bubbles in them. So this young woman here is um, being very possessive of her glass plates. So <laughs> everyone had their own glass plates. They have their initials etched on them because if you had a dirty glass plate, <clears throat> your gel would not pour without bubbles in them and you would have to start over. Um, and uh, and then, so that was in um, the late 90, 1990s. And then as we moved into um, the early 2000s, I said that technology went forward, the automated technology thought this was very automated at the time, but moved into these capillary instruments, which are here, shown here. It's kind of like a small refrigerator. Um, but we, could, we were able to put our PCR reaction plates on the deck here. A little robot would load, load the capillaries for us so we wouldn't have to stand at those gels and load them by hand. Um, I don't know if you can see here. This is what we used to have to do. There was, I can't even remember, 96 wells across this gel and you would have to hand load each reaction into the top of the gel. Very manual, very painful. Um, so um, kind of the intervening years at CIDR, this is almost circular. Um, uh, we, um, after the Human Genome Project ended and we had the HapMap Project, that's when CIDR moved from the linkage studies to SNP-based um, mind mapping studies and the GWAS array studies. Okay. On second generation sequencing. So this is a picture of our first second generation sequencer at CIDR. The um, first really company to develop a second generation sequencer was Selexa. Um, it was Helicos, but the most well-known company was Selexa, um, which was then bought by Illumina. And um, they basically have the first really commercially available um, and robust platform for next generation sequencing available in about around 2006 or seven, probably we got one in 2008. Um, as I said, the amount of data now generated with next generation sequencing is, is massively more than we had with Sanger. So this really had drove us um, the technology on the informatics side um, as we were changing um, our wet lab chemistries as well. <clears throat> So next generation sequencing, some of the shared concepts for all of the different flavors of chemistry that are available. You always have to have a library. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so you basically create a random representation of the genome. Um, you do have to amplify still. You do that either on a solid surface or on a bead. Um, that amplification step always nice and it introduces some duplicates into your, into your data set. Sequencing reactions are a direct step-by-step -step detection. As I said, you do hundreds to thousands of them simultaneously. And um, um, we started um, with exploration sequencing. We would only sequence from one end of the library. Um, and then we, and now we routinely always sequence from both ends. Well, some of the new technology doesn't do this. I'll tell you that, but. Um, 
routinely sequence from both ends of that library molecule. And that helps us when we're trying to map those pieces, sequences of DNA back to the reference genome. You might imagine, um, I haven't said that yet, but these are shorter reads. So Sanger sequencing was able to sequence out to about a KB, so 1,000 base pairs with really high accuracy. So we can get pretty big pieces of DNA, pieces of data, contiguous data. Next generation sequencing was great. We got all this data, but it was short. So we started out actually with like 50 base pair reads, and then it progressed, and now we routinely do about 150 base pair reads. But if you're trying to take a 150 base pair piece of sequence and map it back to the whole human genome, which is 3 billion base pairs, versus 1,000 base pairs mapping back, you can imagine that you're not going to get as good of a match with those short pieces of DNA. So by looking, by having a piece of DNA that you can sequence from both ends, and you can sequence 150 base pairs from both ends, and you know how big that piece of DNA is about, you can tell your algorithm that this piece and this piece, which I know should be about this far apart, it should be about, and that helps then your, your placing of your newly sequenced piece of DNA onto the reference genome. That's called paired end sequencing. Um, so yes, we have much shorter reads for next generation sequencing, so much higher signal to noise. And but another really cool thing about next generation sequencing is it's digital. And so you can actually quantitate um, using next generation sequencing. So there's a lot of um, applications which I won't talk about today, such as RNA seq. So you can take your RNA, convert it to cDNA, and then you can sequence. So what you're sequencing is the goal is not to find variations, it's to tell you how much RNA was in that either bulk or single cell experiment that you started with. And so you can actually just count the number of reads you get. Um, so library preparation. Um, so really basic, um, you take your pot of genomic DNA, this time you fragment it before you do anything else with it. And um, you basically take the ends and you either um, fill them in with an A tail or do something else so that you can um, ligate an adapter onto the end of them. And you have to put these adapters onto the end of them because, as I said, we're going to do these massive reactions and we have to have a way to grab that, that piece of DNA on the surface. <clears throat> so the first, the main thing that you need on the ends of your genomic DNA um, are these um, adapters which allow you to bind to the sequencing surface. And other things that we've added along the way as technology has advanced are indexes. So um, the sequencing uh, platforms allow for um, huge amounts of data to be generated. And you don't need that much data for every sample that you're trying to um, assay. So basically, we put these indexes in, and we can say to, to tell apart one sample from another sample. So it allows you to pool sequencing reactions, pool um, your experiments for different samples together into one um, lane or one flow cell um, on your sequencing instrument. Um, so very important for really being able to optimize and drive the cost down of sequencing. And then, um, oh, let's see. And then, you have, of course, you have to have your sequencing primers. So um, you always have to have some sort of adapter to capture on the flow cell, and you have to have a sequencing adapter, I mean, a sequencing primer that um, you can annul your sequencing primer to, to start off that sequencing reaction is present at the very end where you want to start sequencing. Mm -hmm. So this flow cell, just to give you a little picture of what it looks like, um, um, they look a little different now, but not all that different. Um, they started out kind of microscope size, size. they've gotten bigger, they were cell phone size for a while, they've come down in size a little bit now. But basically it's a solid surface that again, you have oligos um, across the surface that you use to grab those pieces of library that you want to sequence. <clears throat> We started out um, with randomly, um, all of those kind of randomly placed across that surface. And um, the efficiency of that is not as much as if you could actually, um, you could say, I know I'm going to have this many capture points on this flow cell for my library to be attached. Um, so um, as time went on, pattern flow cells were developed. So basically, um, there's little. Um, <clears throat> The wells within the solid surface are in a pattern, and um, it's much we can get a more efficient 
capture those pieces of the library and um, increase your yield of sequencing for a given sequence. Right. And this is the most recent Illumina technology. It's called the NovaSeq X Plus. So just to give you a, a thought, when you, I'm talking about massively parallel, there are 10 billion clusters, so 10 billion sequencing reactions going on on one of these flow cells, on one of these instruments, and you can run two flow cells at one time. So with the biggest capacity flow cells, which are 25 billion clusters, you can generate data for a billion sequencing reactions in 24 hours. And you can sequence about 120 human whole genomes in that time. The instrument itself costs about $1.25 million. And the reagents cost I'm not even going to say come up there. So back to next generation sequencing technologies and kind of the different flavors of them. Um, uh, as I said, uh, you either have to amplify your template on a solid surface or on a bead. So, and um, these are just uh, descriptions or diagrams or those two options. So the bead-based template amplification is off. It's done using an emulsion reaction. Um, there are two currently utilized sequencing platforms which do use the type of temp template amplification that are the ion torrent system and the newest, one of the newest during the sequencers called the Ultima sequencer. And basically, um, instead of um, having that flat flow cell that I that I showed you before, the oligos are the library do oligos on um, very small beads. And you basically make a droplet that contains, hopefully, one library molecule and your bead with your oligos to attach to. And then you amplify within that uh, emulsion um, environment, you amplify that single library molecule. So you have enough signal to actually detect the sequence. Um, the solid bias amplification, I, it's those flow cells that I just showed you, where it's a solid surface and a pattern flow cell, this is the Illumina technology, <coughs> is the biggest player um, using this type of template amplification right now. And again, that, that lawn of oligos or that pattern um, um, here, the pattern of, um, of oligos um, captures a single library molecule, and we do what's called bridge amplification. So those I showed you in the library have two um, two adapters, and um, you can basically uh, the, the, um, sorry the DNA polymerase amplifies that single molecule by um, amplifying this strand, and then you'll attach this end, and then you then you amplify going the other way. So you make these little clusters that you then release um, the ends, and you end up with little clusters of your library that are all the same molecule. So you have enough um, signal to be able to see with the technology. So then how do we actually sequence that piece of DNA? So we've made enough of our individual library fragments to see what's going on, but then what are the different ways that you can actually generate your sequence? And um, <clears throat> um, one is by uh, tight addition. So, um, the two kind of flavors of chemistry that use this type of addition. So back to thinking about Sanger sequencing, where we put one dideoxine at a time. Um, these reactions put one um, uh, nucleotide into, into the chemistry at a time. And um, there's uh, pyro sequencing, and then there's ion torrent, which is a semiconductor sequencing. Um, the details are probably not as important as you understanding that these types of chemistries will have increased error rates in any kind of homopolar runs. So if you have a run of T, so TTT or CCC or DGG, these chemistries are not going to be able to um, detect how exactly how many bases there are in that run, as well as if you have a chemistry that's putting in base at a time. Um, and, uh, let's see. And the newest platform, the Ultima, which is giving us the quote unquote $100 genome, you know, is using the single nucleotide addition chemistry and also uses single N3s. So there are some um, challenges to the data for that. Um, it uses um, reversible um, terminators and um, 
the chemistry has all four nucleotides in the reaction at one time. So um, basically, all four nucleotides are labeled somehow, put into the reaction, and this is your um, sequencing primer sitting here on your identical little pieces of library. And you put all four nucleotides in, and you're able to basically those nucleotides bind. And it ends because it's a terminator. You shine a laser on it, have a camera, you say, what color is this little spot? And it tells you what base is um, present within this library fragment. And then you have to cleave off the hydroxyl and um, allow, um, uh, so, and allow the extension reaction to continue. Um, so a little visually, I think it's nice to think about um, just kind of going back to how, how did Sanger sequencing work? So, um, <clears throat> For this, ooh, sorry, <laughs> if you look at this um, upper left yellow dot here, this is one piece of DNA that you're generating sequence for, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, the whole thing, I'm sorry. The whole, uh, the whole box here contains those pieces of library that you're generating sequence for. This is your first cycle. So you put all four nucleotides on, and you see um, yellow for A. Sorry, um, this is not right. This dot is a single um, read. So the first base, first cycle is A, yellow. You can see over here. The second base is G, blue. Third base is C, red, C, T. So, sorry, the box is whatever. Could be multiple beads or it could be a flat flow cell. Just think of it in billions instead of a handful. And then each cycle in the um, single sequencing by synthesis method, each cycle, you take a picture and you see what is that base at that cycle. And then you just, uh, you just collect that um, intensity and color information as you go. Okay, um, one of the newest sequencers that I said is called the Ultima Sequencer. Um, it is utilizing, as I just said, single base flow. So there is some issues with um, the accuracy of homopolymer repeats, or as you might think about um, insertion and deletion polymorphisms, where you have either small numbers of bases inserted or deleted. Those types of variants are not as accurate with this technology, and it's using single end instead of double um, paired end reads. So um, the, the kind of structural variant calling is not going to be as good either because you're not going to have as good a mapping of the reads. Um, it's a really cool technology. And what the differences really are, instead of having a closed flow cell, you have this open surface that looks like a an old um, record, basically. And you put your library on Can you please make sure to mute if you're online? I am not a host. Uh, anyway, so a couple of unique things about the technology is that you can drive the cost down instead of having all the nucleotides labeled as you go through your different cycles. They have a very small percentage of the nucleotides labeled, so they're driving down the cost that way. And then um, uh, the other thing is um, they kind of have this open surface, so they put the library in the middle or the pool of libraries and basically um, using um, centripetal force um, distribute the library across the flow cell. Um, so basically, the, the the cost of these blood cells themselves are cheaper because they don't have to do as much, um, you know, patterning and all that fancy stuff. Um, so basically, this technology is now commercially available. Um, the instrument again is about only two five million dollars. Fancy that. Um, but the, to generate enough data to, for a human whole genome, um, the price is about a dollar per gig, or maybe around a hundred dollars per genome. Um, 
And um, it's really being used in a lot of the fields where I was talking about counting methods, um, where you need to really to generate huge amounts of data because you're looking at very rare um, events that you're trying to detect, um, or um, um, it, it actually can be used for clinical work as well, um, if you really understand the error profiles that you're getting out of this, um, and you can uh, uh, reassure yourself that it's not impacting the clinical regions that you're interested in. Um, and then really another new platform that's very cool, I think, is using a different kind of chemistry called sequencing by binding. That's called the Onso Sequencer. Um, it was a company bought by PacBio, but it's in the desk sequencer, where you have this uh, single base extension reaction, basically very similar to the Illumina chemistry, except they don't um, have the reversible terminators. They interrogate the space, the first base that's added. And then they release it, and then they put a new a natural base in here. So they don't have kind of the scarring that, that happens with the, um, with the reversible terminator chemistry and their accuracy is higher. So instead of kind of aluminum chemistry, we get about 80% of the bases at um, greater than a Q30, so one in a thousand um, error rate. Um, the onto chemistry has about 90% of the bases being generated at Q40. So we're getting back up to that level of accuracy that we saw with Sanger sequencing. And that, um, oh, I think I took those details out. So um, platform, again, is very attractive to um, fields where you're looking for rare events. So in cancer sequencing, when you're looking at tumors and you're trying to find a rare event in a tumor, you really normally have to sequence very, very deep. But... Um, this chemistry, because of the reduction in error rate, you can really you can reduce the amount of sequence that you have to generate. Um, so. um, how am I doing, Larry? Five minutes or fifteen. Yeah, questions. Um, I am not here to talk to you about informatics, but next generation sequencing is a huge amount of data, and it's a very very complicated analysis. This is a slide <laughs> which kind of walks you through the um, very kind of high level steps that you have to do to go from a sequencing read to a variant call to knowing what those variant calls mean and then interpreting them and trying to figure out, um, you know, am I, um, what is what does all the sequencing data mean, basically. Um, it's really driven um, forward the area of informatics um, in, in a huge way. And then just a plug for all of the younger people in the audience to always make sure you look at your data. It's gotten harder and harder and rarer and rarer for people. You kind of send your sample out and you get your sequencing data back and you really don't think about, could there be something wrong with this data? Um, so I, I encourage you all, if you are following up on something um, that either genotyping or sequencing, that you go back to the raw data, that you bring it into some sort of visualization software, that you look at that region and um, see if it looks clean, if there's any artifacts, those types of things. And this is, um, there's a really great viewer that's used by the whole community that was developed by Broad many years ago called the Integrated Genome Viewer, IGV, which is what we look at um, next generation sequencing with, almost everybody uses. Um, and um, it allows you to these um, uh, uh, little gray lines along here are basically every read piled up on top of each other. And then you have a summary section here, which tells you kind of overall what those coverages are. And then you can see in color, what are the differences from the reference genome? And here you're seeing that there's a large deletion in this tumor. You can see the difference in the read coverage in this region is marking a deletion. <clears throat> and this is just showing you, you have a header as I get um, uh, the type variant here because you're seeing about half of those reads are Cs versus Gs in the reference, for instance. But just a plug to make sure that you are, if you are diving into data and following up on either sequencing or genotyping variants, that you actually look at your life before you waste your time. Um, limitations of next generation sequencing, I think we've talked about mostly. Um, shorter reads with a higher error rate. There's lots of different biases depending on the sequencing chemistry and platform you are using. So you need to be familiar with what those biases are. So you are um, aware of possible issues with the data you're getting back. I didn't talk about duplication um, and library complexity much, but um, it's probably a detail you don't need to worry about too much if you're not generating the data yourself. Um, we talked about having to pool samples together in order to take advantages of the 
um, lower cost and the really high throughput of these of these platforms. Um, we talked about data analysis being really time consuming. You have to have a lot of informatic support and that you, this data is not going to be as clean as Sanger, maybe unless you have an on -site. Um, so kind of ways we get around these issues are, um, I've ta already talked about depth of coverage. So um, if you have a higher error rate, but you're looking at that same position many, many, many times, you can be more confident that you've made an accurate call. You basically have a consensus column at that position by having many, many sequencing reads that cover that position. So that's depth of coverage we talk about. Um, uh, I'm going to skip the duplicate read thing. Um, and we can index our samples as I talked about to be able to take advantage of the, the scale of these platforms and be have have low cost experiments. And we can also target a subset of the genome. I didn't talk about it, but instead of generating a sequence for the whole genome, we can, for instance, take our pot of human DNA, our libraries that we've and um, the libraries that we've generated and hybridize them to probes that will allow us to pull out only a smaller region of the genome that we want to look at. Um, a common um, Product is a whole exome sequence, which basically um, you take a pool of probes that are um, complementary to all the exonic sequences in the genome, about 1% of the genome, and um, you can pull out those particular uh, pieces of DNA and then just sequence those. So it's a much lower cost experiment. You have a lot less data to deal with, um, so it, it helps. And um, for clinical work, um, um, you basically don't end up with, which can be Okay, so third generation sequencing. Reminder of what this is single molecule sequencing. So we're going from these hugely parallel, many, many reactions. We're still looking at many simultaneous reactions, but we're looking at a single molecule instead of amplifying that up into um, um, a clone that has enough signal that we can see. We're able to look at single molecules. There's two main players, um, Oxford Nanopore and CatBio. Um, this is a diagram from um, one of the um, articles I'm recommending for you guys. Um, and there's nice diagrams here. I will dive into the details a little more. So CatBio sequencing, I'm gonna start a video playing here. There is no sound in the video, and I'll try to kind of walk you through the right-hand side as we go. But PacBio was the first third-generation single molecule sequencer. And one of the coolest things I think about PacBio is people don't talk about a lot is that the sequencer really is um, a series of micro wells, which um, result in a, micro a very, very powerful microscope being at the bottom of that well. And you'll, you'll see how that happens in the video here. Um, <clears throat> but basically it allows, it's such a powerful microscope that, that you can detect a single molecule, a single base as it's added into. And that single base extension we talked about, you can you can keep that single base, that single fluorophore being added. Uh, so we'll go ahead. So um, uh, the wells that we talk about in a pack bio sequencer are, are called zero mode waveguides. So each, each of these flow cells has tens of thousands of these zero mode waveguides. And it's a teeny, 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 tiny well. And then a light comes up from below. But the light, the wavelength is actually too big to get through that. So the bottom is about 20 to 30 nanometers. And that diffraction process basically creates a really, really powerful microscope down there. So then the technology itself, you make a library. Um, which is basically a circular library here. It's captured at the bottom with a DNA polymerase. So this right here at the bottom is a DNA. Ooh. A little ball at the bottom is a DNA polymerase. And then you have all four nucleotides fluorescently labeled put into the reaction at one time. You start 
basically sequence in your DNA polymerases, pulls in a nucleotide, and as it's released, you get signal, you get light. And that zero mode waveguide has created such a powerful microscope that you can actually detect the color of that at every cell. Very good. It took a long time for this technology to get to be routinely usable and reproducible, but it now is. I have a production scale instrument called the Revio, and um, um, it's really come a long way. It's very, very powerful, powerful technology with really high accuracy. Accuracy similar to now to the next generation sequencing. NGS, the Q, the Q30 level. Um, so we'll move on to Nanopore. We've got another little video here. So Oxford Nanopore is the competing technology, single molecule sequencing technology. And this is a biological sequencer, basically. So the idea is that you have um, uh, two electrodes within a well and you have a biological membrane which contains these nanopores. And so these uh, nanopores, then um, if you take native DNA, we add adapters again, um, and we basically um, attach motor enzyme to the DNA, and you can see them pulling down. And they through just these libraries into the ocean, and they fall down, and the motor enzyme basically attaches to the nanopore. Slows down molecule enough. If you didn't have this motor enzyme on here, the DNA would just slide through that nanopore. So there's two electrodes you have, and as the DNA goes, um, basically you can you can see the change in the electrical current as each nucleotide trans transverses that membrane through this nanopore. <clears throat> when the protein wasn't here, it would go so fast that we couldn't interpret these changes in signal. So a lot of the um, fine-tuning of this technology really has been both around the, these pores and the motor enzymes and how, how you want to um, balance um, how slow you make this go to how much yield you can get out of each cell. So um, um, it's been a really interesting technology. We do have this technology in my lab. It's been super interesting to work with. and um, it's really kind of odd to think about these blood cells that were coming in. They, they really have biological, you know, <laughs> biological membrane in them. They do have an expiration date that's real. You know, you really have to make you know, be careful with your handling of them. Um, but the advantages of the Oxford Nanopore technology over um, Tech Bio technology, it's a much, not much, but a little bit younger technology. The the um, company is much more kind of open, so they have kind of open community. They've always been very open, where they have as soon as they develop something, they, they let us play with it, and uh, all the software is open source. Um, and so it's not quite as um, I, wanna, I don't want to say robust, but um, um, if you're thinking about clinical utility or clinical use, everything changes really fast with Oxford. Um, so it's a little hard to kind of lock down a clinical test using Oxford Nanopore. Certainly possible, but a little harder than with the PacWire platform. But the adva huge advantages with Oxford Nanopore is it's it's portable. So these sequencers, the Revio is like a big refrigerator. Um, I think I have a picture. Yeah. So the Revio is like a big refrigerator. Um, Oxford Nanopore has this is their biggest sequencer, which looks kind of two toasters put together here. Um, and there's smaller versions of these toasters, which I mean, toasters, <laughs> called like a min ion, which is basically the size of that. So it's portable. So a lot of really cool genetics has been done. Um, if you think about virus, viral out outbreaks, for instance, um, the Ebola outbreak years ago, um, uh, people took min ion sequencers into that community and were able to sequence in the community and be able to try to identify what was going on. And um, so um, one advantage is the portability. The other is the um, um, the length of the fragments that you, that you can sequence. So with Oxford Nanopore, you can sequence up to hundreds of KB in contiguous DNA. Um, with the PacBio, you really have to have an, uh, a library. Um, I didn't talk about it, but the library in the PacBio sequencer, when you're in the bottom of that zero-mode waveguide, 
to get the really high accuracy, you make a circular library and you just the sequence around and around and around and around that circle, circle. So you're limited by how long the piece of DNA that you can sequence is. But that's for nanopore, you really are not. So you want as long of DNA as possible to make those initial libraries with. Um, and um, and you can go as long as that or we'll keep sequencing. It's very, very cool. The other thing is that epigenetics that we talked about, the five methyl cytosine detection and five hydroxy methyl cytosine detection, both of those epigenetic markers can be sequenced on these platforms. Um, I work with some experts in the field and, and they right now are saying that the Oxford nanopore uh, detection is a little better for um, epigenetics than PacBio currently is. Um, but on both platforms, you can get both of those uh, data points, both variation and um, bimethyl cytosine information in the same experiment with no extra cost. So, um, the main advantage, really, one of the main advantages for when you're talking about human genetics and human genetic research, for looking at or using uh, third generation sequencing, these single molecule sequencers that do allow for much longer. Um, reads is structural variant detection is much, much um, better. As you can imagine, if you can get contiguous long reads, as you can see, this is an IGB viewer I was showing you earlier. This is an Oxford nanopore um, sequence, this is a bio sequence, and this is a luminous, yeah, luminous sequence. So these little gray lines are the reads. You can see they're really, really short for Illumina. You can see the white in between them. And these are long contiguous reads from um, the third generation sequencers. And so with these very long contiguous reads, we have a much better ability to, for instance, see insertions. This mark here is showing me that there's an insertion, so extra DNA um, beyond what's seen in the reference. <coughs> um, and this Venn diagram, uh, this slide provided to me by Winston Tim, with um, third generation sequencing. But um, you can find many, many thousands more structural variants using long read sequencing than you can with short read sequencing. Um, again, I said you can detect the epigenetic marks natively without any act. And I think I'm going to almost stop here, but I'll show you one another cool video. So another thing you can do with Oxford Nanopore, which you can't do with HiBio, is something that we call adaptive sequencing. So if you really do want to focus um, on a small region of the genome, for instance, you want to do a clinical test for the trinucleotide repeat diseases, um, you want to use long read sequencing because um, that would be much better for you to be able to really get through these really long regions of repetitive DNA. Um, you can actually informatically give that sequencer with the big tower next to it, compute tower next to it. That electrical signal is instantaneously analyzed by that compute tower. You can tell it, I only want to sequence these particular pieces of DNA in the genome. It can be 1% of the genome or even less. And as it's coming through the core here, as it's generating that electrical pulses that's saying that's what these bases are. You know, it's pretty error prone, but it can kind of tell where you are. If that region, that sequence doesn't match the file that you give it or what you want to sequence, it pushes that sequence back out of the port. So you don't sequence that. So it allows you to enrich really without any kind of probes, any kind of hybridization reaction, really just informatically enrich for particular regions of the genome. So another really cool um, <coughs> option for us for nanopore sequence. Can you tell me about So, in conclusion, uh, you want to be able to choose the right method, the right instrument for kind of the experiment that you want to do. Things you want to consider are the accuracy. What kind of accuracy do you need? Are you doing cancer genetics or not? Those kinds of things. Um, what is the scale, the throughput of what you're looking at? Are you looking at a handful of samples or thousands of samples? What's the cost? Obviously, you always have a budget. <clears throat> what are the analysis challenging? Challenges, I, do I want to use some really cool cutting edge um, new chemistry um, if I don't have the informatic support to be able to really analyze the data when I get it out? Am I going to have to develop new pipelines and I have to benchmark new chemistries? What kind of controls would I need? And then really what are the unique advantages of each platform and how would they benefit or detract from my my end goal? What is my question that I'm asking? Um, I think I can end there. Yeah. Happy to take on the record questions for. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ben. Um, thank you.
thank you for your talk, which is really, really cool. Um, one of the things We're I, <laughs> um, one of the things I thought was interesting was when you showed um, the cost of the of sequencing the human genome. Uh, there was a specific drop, I think, around two thousand seven. And it kept going down, but like specifically 2007, 2010, mm -hmm. you were talking about second generation sequencing right. around that time. Mm -hmm. So do you think there was one specific optimized technology that brought forth that huge drop? Or do you think it was more of a combination of everything brought on by that second generation, uh, specifically in that area? Yeah, I mean, it was a combination. There were many players um, at the beginning of second generation sequencing. Um, Illumina kind of took over. O over time, but yeah, there's was five, four, five, four, five, four. There was Illumina. There was, I'm trying to remember all that. There was a, a handful of platforms, so it wasn't just one company, but it was really that the technology, the massively parallel sequencing, which really allowed the cost to come down. Mm -hmm. really. And then you also mentioned Ultima's new technology, which you said the um, this what I think is the whole mostly natural by sequencing mm -hmm. technology yep. where they don't use all the. The fluoro. A small proportion of the nucleotides are fluoro. So that, that drove down the cost. Do you think there was also some technology related to the reagents that brought down the cost as well, or other things in that tech that were, could um, bring about this $100 genome? You know? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of the cost reduction is both that really simple flow cell. Okay. It's just like a, like I said, it looks like a record. <laughs> um, it's just like a flat silica wafer. There's really nothing. You just have to blow all of those across it. Um, and the simple way that they load their libraries. Um, so um, they, they do use emulsion PCR. So um, that's a separate instrument, which um, I think is included in, I mean, included in the cost, I guess, for reagents. But um, so they basically simplified a lot of things that kind of went back to emulsion PCR. They went single end chemistry. They reduced the amount of fluorescent nucleotides. Um, there's nothing particularly crazy different, you know, about the actual chemistry itself. Okay. And I know, you know here at NHGRI, we've been uh, putting a lot of efforts into this $1,000 genome. Mm -hmm. um, and then UG claims this $100 genome. Do you think it's going to get even cheaper? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, on the conclusion slide, when you spoke to analysis or you spoke to accuracy mm -hmm. and you just offhandedly mentioned, are you sequencing cancer cells or not? Mm -hmm. Would there need to be more or less accuracy when it came to that? So it's a trade-off between accuracy and depth with, with okay. cancer. So if you're, if you're doing cancer genetics and you're looking at tumors, you're looking for somatic changes in a tumor, mm -hmm. those are... Um, <clears throat> You're basically looking at um, a tumor, which is a collection of cells. So you have a pot of DNA. So the, the somatic changes are going to only be a small proportion of those reads that you actually see. Okay. So you have to get to much higher depths to be able to see those low frequency changes that are happening in the tumor. Right. Um, so you can either generate really like thousand fold, like some of the cancer assays, you need a thousand reads per position, like mm -hmm. really, really deep versus 30 for a human whole genome. Right. Um, and, you know, that depth will um, allow you to say, I can get down to a 5% of the reads that I could actually detect a variant in. You know, 5% of that tumor would have a variant that I'd be able to see with my experiment. <clears throat> if you have higher accuracy, you basically, um, you might be able to only, um, have a depth of you know 300 or 500 and still be able to confidently say that I can see an event that happens 5% of the time. Okay. Because um, some of the, like for instance, um, uh, with a, with an accuracy of one in a thousand, you might um, you know, experimentally you can say, you can see that you need at least three, probably five, maybe 10 reads to really be sure that you're seeing a non-reference called at that position with an accuracy of Q, Q30. If you have an accuracy of Q40, you might be able to say, if I read to three reads, I'm really confident that I am seeing this change. Taking a step further back, um, if a tumor, like 5% of tumor cells have a variant, mm -hmm. what does that, what can that actually tell you clinically or like why is that important? 
Oh, um, well, that um, that variant can actually be um, kind of uh, the start of an event where um, it might be a mutation in tumor suppressor gene, so that so that 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 tumor cell population, once it acquires that variant, it's going to start um, uh, not having its appropriate cell cycle control, so you'll get out of control growth. And so, um, yeah, so it's basically you're looking for um, variants, mutations, which affect known cancer genes normally. Um, I'm seeing this variant, so that means even at a 5% level, it could mean that they are now, um, the drug that I'm giving them is not working anymore, so it's escaped that. It could mean that it could tell you that I could use a particular drug to help control this tumor. So in, can in cancer genetics, it's usually more about how does this variation, does it tell me something about the cancer? It could tell me that this is an aggressive cancer or maybe not such an aggressive cancer, or it could tell me about treatment options. Mm -hmm. um, this drug or that drug might be, or you can look at whether someone's relapsing, basically. use genetics to determine that as well. <clears throat> No, go ahead. Oh. Um, so it's a two-part question, kind of looking back and looking forward with a small piece of tech or equipment that would have vastly helped you in your PhD that you have access to now, and then what's a piece of tech or equipment you wish would be developed? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Something, like, small scale, like mm -hmm. that you had to tape it or something, not like the big oh. <laughs> Um, Maybe not tech or equipment, but... um. <clears throat> Um, but we didn't have the human genome when I was yes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that would you know that would have been a huge help. Um, we didn't even have the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome yet. So um, yeah, I mean it's just it's such a different world now that you can you know access a database and find out all these things about this piece of this variant I just sequenced or this piece of DNA that I'm looking at. Um, a lot of my my thesis was spent doing cyber sequencing and sequencing a clone. Um, so um, certainly would have been great to absolutely not have to do that and looked at more biological questions at the time. Mm -hmm. um, something in the future. Um, I mean, I think if we can, I think the Oxford nanopore, the really small portable sequencing is is potentially you know, a game changer for public health. Um, so I think really just continuing to optimize that technology or others that are like it, where you can really have very um, small, portable, accurate sequencing platforms you can take out into the field for microbiome, for viral research, you know, for, for testing. Yeah, that's just, I think, what will have the most Okay. Oh, um, my question was about um the pack pack bio. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know the ONT has this like motor enzyme that kind of slows it down. Does pack bio have something similar to that, like a motor enzyme? Like how fast? I think so I think it's just that the polymerase is basically tethered at the mm -hmm. end of that zero mode waveguide. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I think it's really just the process, the processiveness of that polymerase. Okay. That, so how fast are like the fluorescents like coming out? Like, are you actually like counting the lights or when you watch it? Okay. Yeah. And do they cost the same? It's called a movie. So for pack black, they say you have a movie. So basically, it's it's a camera. It's just taking a movie okay. of those flashes of light and and then converting that into what were those faces? Okay. Sorry. And oh, and the video uh, in the video was that um in one cell. Like each cell has a polymerase, or is that each zero mode waveguide? Okay, yeah. so you each little mic think of it as a teeny tiny microscope. Okay, it has the polymerase tethered at the bottom, and you make your library, and they just kind of float down. In hopefully, you get one, <laughs> one molecule in each of those zero mode waveguides, and then it, you know, it tethers itself. To, it, the polymerase grabs it and starts flying. So each cell would theoretically have the same sequence. No, no, they don't. No, so you have a library you create like from your whole genome. So your library is basically a random representation of the genome. Mm -hmm. So every fragment that comes down, hopefully, is different. So okay. you're actually generating sequence from different regions of the genome. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's no 
for formal questions, we'll close the formal part of the talk now. And we'll go off the recording, but still you can ask anything off the record. <laughs> not to have a so anything that goes on now, even though it still says report, will not be on the record. We will making a note to Elvaro to delete from here on. <laughs> We do not exist. Anyway, any questions about my tool? Or, yeah, if someone else did, do you want to ask? Yeah, I already asked you. Uh, sure. Um, I was wondering a lot of the like in a very like micro scale, but you mentioned you're like into your postdoc, you wanted to zoom out a bit more on humans. Mm -hmm. What kind of in your career has been that side of things, and how does that connect to this very like mm -hmm. technology stuff? Right, the technology stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, I, my group basically uses all these technologies. As new technologies come out, we evaluate them for um, uh, will they work well? Do they, do they have good accuracy? Actually, have do experiments to make sure what the accuracy is. Um, um, is it more cost effective than what I'm using right now? What are the benefits? And you know, kind of what I said. Yeah. So, as I said, my group are gene hunters. So we started out doing the lymphic studies and then we moved um, to the genome association studies. And then we started um, doing whole exome studies, which kind of circled us back to the more Mendelian disorders. And, um, but then the complex trait disorders, as well as the cost of that next generation sequencing came down. Um, and, and now the whole genome sequencing as well. But um, the goal of my group and what we do really is we take um, other investigators' studies um, so they design an experiment, 